test got bumped back. But the test got bumped back. <laughs> okay, because I figure it's going to be kind of tough to get through all that we need to get through. Um, all right. So uh, let's talk about air masses. Okay. Oh, by the way, so homework that's due today, I got a pile up here. That's good. Anybody else want to hand in their homework? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Four of us. That sounds right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, um, to me, like here in Iowa, you know, it's like the joke is, if you don't like the weather, wait till tomorrow because you'll get different weather, right? So usually, what's happening basically is we have different a different chunk of air, a different that's coming through. Okay, an air mass that's cold or an air mass that's warm, they kind of alternate. If, if things are working, they do kind of do that. Okay, so air masses are kind of important. So there are five types of air masses, and um, these are kind of going to show you the picture of, of, of a couple of air masses. Let's kind of get some darkness up here. Ooh, doesn't this look like maybe a storm cloud, maybe? Okay, and this looks really arid, really dry over here. So the five types of air masses that we're going to um, talk about, um, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you which ones these are. So maritime, we use the little letter M, okay? And tropical, we use a capital T. So there's one of the five, maritime tropical. So then what your author's done is quite clever. So over here, instead of maritime, it's continental. So for this one, we use a little letter C, okay, and it's polar, so we use a capital P. So it is kind of case sensitive. So there's only five air masses, and here's two, maritime tropical, maritime meaning wet, tropical meaning warm, continental polar, continental meaning dry, polar meaning cold. Okay, so those are, those are um, um, two of the five. So the thing about an air mass is it's, um, it's a chunk of air, really kind of a, usually a large chunk of air, maybe the size of a state or larger. Okay. And the thing about air masses, it, or an air mass, is basically throughout it has, just like you saw a minute ago, it has the same moisture content kind of throughout at least horizontal layers. You know, it, it, even the maritime ones would be probably getting drier as you go up, right? And the continental ones might be picking up moisture as you go up. I don't know. But moisture and temperature. So if you're asked on a test, hint, hint, the two things that kind of define an air mass, it's is it moisture dry and is it warm or cold, okay? So temperature and moisture. And in Chapter 9, we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about where these air masses meet. We call that a front, but uh, that's actually for the next chapter. So I think fronts are exciting because if we have a blob of air here, you know, and a blob of air here, B, and A and B have different temperatures or moisture conditions, then the front is actually right here. Okay. These are big blobs of air, right? Um, so go ahead and put up the second part here. The thing about that chunk of air that's moist or that chunk of air that's dry or that chunk of air that's cold or that chunk of air that's warm is it didn't, it only got that way by sitting over what we call a source region for I think a couple of weeks. I don't know, I can't remember what I've read, maybe about two weeks it has to sit there. It's kind of like you're making stew and it takes a while to let it simmer, okay? And then after it basically has sat over land and become dry or sat over the ocean and become moist or sat over somewhere hot and warmed up or sat over somewhere cool and cooled down, then it goes on the move, okay? So here's the deal. For, for these source regions that makes the two-week thing turn the air mass into an air mass, they have to be have some characteristics. One is that I need to be big, okay? A source region needs to be pretty big. The other thing is a source region needs to be, to me, I think, flat enough for that air mass to leave the nest, for that air mass to move on. So those are kind of things for source regions. So um, this is kind of a repeat slide, it seems like. Okay, so air mass is kind of what I said, an air mass. The biggest things, and I'll kind of underline them here, are moisture and temperature. 
moisture and temperature. Okay, and when it says horizontally, it means kind of in layers. This is all the same moisture, all the same temperature. Um, right. Now, um, the five air masses we already talked about too, maritime, tropical, and continental polar, those are three of the five, and they kind of remind me of clouds, in that with clouds we kind of mixed the form, whether it's flat or fluffy, with its elevation, alto or zero, and or, and or precipitating. So um, here's your options for temperature, okay? Um, the uh, maritime tropical, we ran into that, that capital T means a warm air mass. It means it sat somewhere warm before it moved on. We turn it, We saw a continental polar. P means cold. And actually there's something even colder than polar, Arctic. Okay, if you've heard something about an Arctic air mass, has, we're under the influence of an Arctic air mass. Okay, yeah, they're very cold. So that's the temperature. And then we kind of need, need to mix and max, max, match temperature with moisture. So here's your two options with regard to moisture. If your source region is land mass, we call that continental. That's a dry air mass if it sat over land. Um, if it sat over the ocean, it's going to be moist. We call that a maritime. These are lowercase, though. And so here's your possibilities. Okay, I'll just kind of put all of these up here. So notice that um, the condition of the moisture goes first. It's lowercase. Continental would be dry. Maritime would be moist. And then the condition of your temperature goes next. So tropical is warm or hot. Uh, polar is cold. And Arctic is very cold. So those are kind of your options. Okay. So kind of want to be getting those under your belt. The one that's missing is actually we don't have the second one for Arctic. So we only have continental Arctic. We don't have maritime Arctic. And I can't remember. Sometimes in this chapter it's been um, a question at the end of the chapter. But the reason there is no maritime Arctic is that dot, dot, dot. What do you think? It's that cold. Exactly. Very, very cold. And it holds very little moisture, exactly. I'm going to say, so holds little moisture. You got it. That's moisture. All right. So five types of air masses. And, you know, if you've ever, if you're like me, um, the whole... The whole weather forecasting thing, which we're going to eventually talk about, um, is kind of a tricky thing. It's almost an art. And to me, it's a little bit of an art saying, yeah, there was this blob of air that moved, okay? This was a, you know, an air mass. And it's like, eh, a little bit subjective. In fact, even when they go to where, draw in weather fronts where, where uh, air masses are meeting, that's a little bit subjective. All right, so here are your five... Um, air masses again. Uh, notice uh, we have, they're kind of written as the dry ones first, right? Continental, you should be thinking dry. Uh, maritime, moist. Okay, and then we have an assortment of temperatures over here. But always the, um, the continental or maritime is a lowercase. And then the tropical, uh, polar, arctic, T, P, or A, respectively, are capitalized. All right, source regions. Dun, dun, dun. But notice before I kind of reveal these source regions, and these make sense. I'm, I'm excited in things in science that make sense. You're like, oh, I buy that. Okay. So these are winter time. These are places in the winter that could provide um, a couple weeks for something to dwell and to pick up characteristics. For, so for instance, the source region, we have a couple source regions up there at the top. Okay, Notice they're kind of over Canada and kind of lower Canada-ish, I guess. Okay, So they're continental, lowercase c, dry. And then we have the Arctic and the polar. So these would be continental Arctic, continental polar. Okay, So they sit there for a while and then move south. So that makes sense, right? 
These make sense. We have wings. We have a pair of polar because they're cold, right? They're at upper latitudes, but they're over oceans. We have one over the Pacific Ocean, one over the Atlantic Ocean, okay? So they're maritime, they're moist, and they're cold, they're polar, so maritime polar. Those would be source regions from both directions, or west and east, for those air masses. Then we have the orange down here, and that's warm. So you're kind of seeing um, a couple of locations for uh, warm, moist air. Okay, so warm, tropical. Um, moist, that gives the prefix M for not moist, but M is actually for maritime. So notice that actually one of our so source regions is the Gulf. It's kind of a separate source region from the Atlantic and the Pacific. All right, so that was winter. Now, there are two air, there's one in winter and one in summer. There are two air masses that only appear, they're seasonal air masses. I'm going to go ahead and highlight this one. This one is only winter. Continental Arctic, only in the winter. Because in the summertime, it's not really cold enough to give you know, that continental Arctic sort of deal. So the next figure is in the summertime. Notice the title up there, in the summertime. It's funny, um, when I switched textbooks and was kind of trying to pull out from this textbook things to present, I, I had to look at these back and forth. I'm like, what are they different? They're like source regions, you know? Oh, one's in the winter and one's in the summer. Okay, so right off the top, notice that we don't have our Arctic. We don't have our continental Arctic, but we have our continental polar, even in the summertime. And then the same thing we had before, we basically have these two source regions for polar air, maritime polar air, right? And then we have source regions down here for the maritime tropical, okay, so that's all kind of the same, minus missing the continental Arctic. But now, and I'm going to kind of emphasize this because this did make it to the test, we finally get that continental tropical source region continental tropical. It's that kind of hot orange right there. And I'm going to put next to this one, only in the summertime. Only in America. No. Only in the summertime. Only in summer. Did you get this one? Okay. So continental tropical. Dry, hot. Be here. Yeah, that's true. Forest fires, dry, hot. It'll be here before we know it. All right. So one of the things you might already be thinking is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it becomes dry or it becomes moist or it becomes hot or it becomes cold. And if it moves somewhere that's different than that, it's going to start changing. And you are very right. You are very right. And that's actually called air mass modification. Can be, can be. Um, I'm gonna. She was asking about um, when it becomes modified. Is that where it becomes unstable? Or stable? Yeah. And what I've read is, in general, if you're looking for instability, any air mass that has a degree of moisture is going to be unstable, and any air mass that's generally warm is going to be unstable. So if it's kind of picking up those characteristics, yeah, it's going to be. It's not necessary. Not necessarily. So here uh, is a figure from your textbook kind of showing where something that started out as cold and dry, okay, moving south, if it's staying over the continent, it's going to stay dry. But if it's moving south, it's not going to stay cold, right? So negative 46 Celsius, okay, negative 33, okay, you kind of see it becomes modified. Its temperature becomes warmer, air mass modification. Not to say that these folks in Houston don't think, uh, I don't know what time of year this is, folks in Houston don't think negative 4 Celsius um, is cold, but it's not as cold as negative 46 Celsius. Okay, so air mass modification. Um, this kind of term just kind of throw in there, uh, thrown in there, we are having... Um, an air mass weather situation, basically when 
whatever air mass has landed on us, we're just kind of soaking up that weather associated, you know, whether it's dry or wet or hot or cold from that air mass. So, um, uh, you know, kind of back to what Autumn said, I'll kind of reveal. The thing on this slide that interests me is that um, this column here with stability, okay. Um, in general, if you're looking for um, unstable, you're looking for air to rise, Basically, look for something that has a degree of moisture and it is hot or warm. Okay, so the air mass in and of itself, um, continental tropical, although they're dry, they're warm. Okay, uh, maritime polar, okay, although they're cold, they're moist. So actually, we kind of have a conditional instability there. Um, the whopper down here is um, with regard to maritime tropical, those ones that can kind of come from the south, uh, you know, Pacific and Atlantic, yeah, and the Gulf, those have both moisture and warmth going for them. So they're kind of a double whammy. What's the, uh, and the associated weather says in winter uh, by the maritime tropical? Does in winter usually becomes maritime tropical and then there's a little W? Let's I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. That's interesting. It's not maritime tropical, but it's got like a yeah. extra designation. Oh, is it, is it says bringing occasional widespread? So maybe. I don't know. I'd look hmm. into it. That's a good point. Good question which I don't know the answer for. So I've kind of interjected a few slides to kind of summarize some characteristics of some of the five air masses. Um, so continental polar, they're not the coldest of them, because Arctic would be the coldest. Um, but uh, they're generally stable, because they don't have moisture, and they're cold. Um, and with that stability can actually, uh, one of the things that, that catches my eye is basically, you know, you don't have upward movement, and so, you know, you're not going to have kind of the cleansing effect, especially if you're putting out the pollution. Um, generally, we don't have uh, clouds or anything with these. So on to lake effect snow. So um, if you've heard of lake effect snow, we usually hear about it hitting kind of our northeast. Michigan. Yeah, Michigan, Great Lakes area. On up into the very northeast. Exactly. Which is what was going on with like Boston and New York and stuff this year, right? I think, and I actually have a uh, video for Boston, but I'm thinking what Boston got hit by was not lake effect snow, but uh, nor'easter. And we'll be talking about those in Chapter 9. A nor'easter is a fancy name for something that has another fancy name called mid-latitude cyclone. So mid-latitude cyclone is as a weather system where is Chapter 9 really talks about that. Okay. But yeah, no pressure. I've um, seen the video where the waves were coming in on the coast there, and it, like in Jersey or wherever it was, and it was so cold that ice was just like coating all of the houses this winter because the waves were coming in so hard. And that's yeah, that was, was the crazy. storm they talked about, storm surge, mm -hmm. and storm surge is a phenomenon we associate with hurricanes, and storm surge is just kind of an interaction with the the something vortex. And it's whipping water up, and so that's that's yeah. weird. All those houses just got coated. It was so cold; they just turned to ice as soon as it touched the houses. Oh my gosh, it was crazy. Um, it was cold. But lake effect snow. It is cold. Lake effect snow. Since we're under the prevailing westerly winds, lake effect snow basically is going to form on the eastern side, kind of the northeastern side of the Great Lakes. And I'll kind of show you this figure. I think does a good job of showing you lake effect snow. So we've been talking about air mass, air masses, and to me, lake effect snow, just like the title says, lake effect snow is an example of air mass modification. See if you can see the air mass being modified. So if you start over here on the west side of the Great Lake, okay, um, and, and lake effect snow is better for, I think, um, kind of the fall sort of 
changing seasons sort of thing. So in order for lake effect snow to best work, you have to kind of think of basically the lakes are still pretty, uh, are still pretty warm. And uh, the land has responded to kind of the cooling temperatures. So here we have a cool, dry air mass. Does that look right? Continental polar, cool, dry air mass. And it's going to go over the Great Lakes. Okay. Well, your Great Lakes, like I said, are still kind of toasty from the summer or the fall. And they're oozing water vapor. Okay. So basically, we have something dry and cold going over something that's kind of got this water vapor going on. So one of the things about something that's dry, it's like, dang, bring in that water vapor. I'm cool with that. So basically, that water vapor goes into that dry, cool air mass. And since it's cool, it can't hold much water vapor, so we can get condensation. Okay. So we see kind of the clouds forming over the lake as it goes. And actually, as it hits here, as it goes from the slick lake to the, to the rough land, actually, it's kind of a lifting mechanism, so it can kind of budge up. Okay, and so then actually I think what that previous slide says is if this is cool enough, instead of rain, you're going to get snow. Okay, but if it's warm enough, you'll get rain. Okay, so that's lake effect snow. So here's a figure from your textbook that, um, that shows you, like I said, kind of the, the, the dark blue is the lots of snow, right? Okay. Um, and you can kind of see it definitely to the east side and kind of the northeast. Folks are getting hit. And so I brought this. This is only like a couple minutes, but you guys got to see this. Um, I, I really like time-lapse videos. And this is a time-lapse video of um, that snowfall. It's so crazy. I can't even imagine. I can't either. How did that we got that, like, what was it, 20 some inches here? That's amazing. Was that like three years ago? Four years ago? I don't know. Was it in one snow event? Yeah, it was. It's like our little blizzard we had here, like, I don't know. I guess maybe it was like five years ago. Just when it was cool. So just sit back and enjoy. <laughs> But they definitely. Their average is 36 to 59. I okay. know they got over 100 this year. Well, <laughs> I'm talking, they <laughs> broke a record. They're in the green. But, but I think, and I have a, um, when we get to um, Nor'easters on Monday, probably on Monday, um, I'll bring up an article that kind of connects the Boston thing with the Nor'easter. So, so this actually is a slide to kind of introduce you to the idea of, of an Arctic front. So I don't know if you remember, but when we talked about the three cells, you know, the, the Hadley, the Farrell, and the Polar, we said that there's something called a polar front between the Farrell and the polar cells, okay, polar front. Actually, that is on your um, review sheet for your exam, so polar front. But Arctic front is different. Arctic front isn't always there. Basically, when we talk about fronts um, uh, Monday, we're going to talk about basically two air masses that clash. And the two air masses that are clashing are both cold, just one's colder than the other. So if, you, if I were to ask you, you know, the difference between continental Arctic and continental polar, you'd say they're both dry, but the Arctic's a lot colder. So kind of where, there is a, where they are meeting, we call that an Arctic front. And it's not always there. All right, it's not there in summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. And then just to kind of put things into perspective about things we talked about last um, uh, in the unit when we talked about the three cells. You know, here's the feral cell. Of course, this is what we're in, okay, the middle cell. And then the polar cell is the cell closest, you know, um, towards the poles or encompasses the poles. And then the polar front actually is between the polar cell and the feral cell. And we'll talk a little bit about polar front when we talk about mid-latitude cyclones, actually. So, um, all right. Uh, maritime polar air masses. So hopefully we're kind of getting <coughs> in, the, in the pattern of maritime polar, breaking it down. What does that mean? Maritime means moist, polar means cold. Okay, so we have a, definitely have a couple source regions that we can get uh, maritime polar 
air masses from. And so I'm, I've been mentioning nor'easters. Um, and so here it actually um, is our nor'easter or northeaster um, uh, storm system can actually kind of come in from our North Atlantic. Uh, moist and cold. Brr, not a good combination. Uh, another figure with uh, um, air mass modification. So you figure, you know, here's uh, North America over here to your right. And so something forming over uh, the continent over there would be uh, dry. Yeah, thank you, Asia. Would be continental polar, okay, if it's up there at upper latitudes. Notice here it's kind of going across the Pacific. It's going to pick up moisture. And this is actually what you were talking about um, with regard to stability, okay? And so it's just kind of being modified as it goes. You know. I've heard um, the whole phenomenon of like two-week dwelling time and it moves on, you know, picks up characteristics of being dry or moist. That it's kind of like when you go somewhere and you pick up an accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. So how's your southern? How's your south? So, more northeast accent. Um, it's always interesting the people from the northeast. For me, their accents are just. The people from the northeast? Yeah. <laughs> Could you speak English, please? <laughs> um, so, um, a while back when we had that table with the five different air masses, we said that um, maritime tropical air masses generally will be unstable. You know, they're moist. They're Moist air, I know it feels oppressive, but actually is less dense than dry air. So it has a tendency to want to rise. All right. So pretty picture of some sort of fluffy cumulus clouds maybe, yeah. Notice the nice flat bottoms, the lifting condensation level, right? Dark Yeah, kind of the dark over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, I don't know. Um, so this kind of says, like I mentioned before, kind of the lifting mechanism when, when, for when something blows from, from smooth water onto land, it can kind of bunch up and, and ascend. All right. Um, let's see. Oops, sorry. So in the summer, um, or I guess not, well, this says summer. Yeah, it says wet summers. In the summertime, we generally can have, clearly have, three source regions for maritime tropical air. And this is kind of showing you the effect of the Gulf maritime tropical um, source region kind of hitting these folks. And this is kind of a, um, within the same unit, we talked about two monsoons. We talked about a monsoon in Asia, and we talked about a monsoon here in North America. And this is kind of revisiting that idea, that in the summertime we can have that warm, moist air. Uh, the intertropical convergence zone moves up, and that warm, moist air can just kind of move right along with it. All right. So your continental tropical air masses, I tried to kind of mention this will be on your test, that this one only, and I don't know if it's a multiple choice question, I think, that in the summertime, that's the only time you're going to get those dry, hot air masses, continental tropical. And they are unstable because they're warm. Yeah. Is that it? That's it for you. Well, I think especially since we're going to bump the test back to Friday, we'll go ahead and quit for today if that's okay with you. Works for me. Thank you. Yes, this chapter will be due on Monday. Very good.